know if the um, if the graph isn't obvious to us what it is, then we have to go to something analytical. And the analytical is using these uh, three um, the three conditions for continuity. So let's just go over and refresh our memory on that. Uh, one is that the um, output value has to be defined at that point. So we had an example here where we said at C1, um, the output value is not defined. It's obvious, maybe, to me at least, it's obvious that it's not continuous because if I want to take my pen, and you can't see me doing this, I guess, um, if you go back to the video, but uh, you can verify that I am going to make it obvious here. If I take my pen and I try to draw from here to here, I must lift my pen up and place it down on the other side to continue drawing. It's called the pencil definition. So if the graph is not obvious <coughs> like this one, that that is an open circle, then we can look at the function and see if the function value is defined. It's not, so therefore it's not continuous. Uh, if we look at uh, C2, is the function value continuous? And it is because there's, an, there's a dot here Okay. Now, don't be mistaken. I'm not asking, is it continuous through here? Oh, maybe I did. I have to rewind my own tape here and see what I did ask you. What I meant to say was, is the function value defined here? And the answer is yes. Is the function continuous here? The answer is no. It's defined because there's a dot. Um, then we go to the second piece of the, of the uh, definition. Is the limit, does the limit exist? And because we're going to this value of output on the less than C2 side and this value of output on the greater than C2 side, we do not have a limit. Or excuse me, we are not continuous here. Third criteria would occur with here, is the function value defined? And the answer is yes. Does the limit exist? And the answer is yes. But are they one and the same? And that's where it breaks down that we have to say no. It is not continuous here because although the function value is defined, the limit exists, they're not one and the same. So that's just the analytical part of what we're doing. Again, a lot of these graphs uh, you, can, <clears throat> you can look at and just tell. Use your intuition. Uh, <clears throat> intuition is good for us in many, many things in life. Why not in math? So in, you know, intuitively, you can see this is not continuous but others are not quite as intuitive. Okay, so we went through a few examples. Uh, we know that polynomial functions are continuous everywhere, so if it's polynomial, you really don't have to go through those three conditions. Just tell me it's polynomial. I know it's continuous then. Um, okay, so we got down to then this piecewise defined. Now, the reason we need to talk about this piecewise is that you know, it's like anything else. The weakest point in a structure is at a joint. So if the joint fails, then the whole thing's going to come down and collapse. So on this one, 3 plus x, just that alone. Nice polynomial function. What do you know about its continuity? Continuous everywhere. Okay. What about x squared plus 1? By itself, it's a nice uh, <clears throat> polynomial function, continuous everywhere, but I can only use inputs less than or equal to 2 for this piece of the function, and I can only use inputs greater than 2 for this piece, so where's the weak point? Where's the possibility of being discontinuous? At 2. So we have to look at that and put it through its paces. Does f of 2 exist? And again, which piece can I use if we're using the input of 2? It's only the top part. This is a common error among math uh, students. It's only the top part we can use because it's only here that we have or equal to. So the output value is 5. Does the limit exist? And the limit is approaching it from both directions. So if I approach it from values less than 2, which piece do I use? The linear or the quadratic? Yeah, I'm going to have to use the linear because this is the only place that we have values less than 2. And so if I do that, I can put, it's a linear, I mean it's a, a polynomial, so I use direct substitution. 
As I approach it from the less than 2, I get 5. What about from the greater than 2 side? Well, the only piece I can use for values greater than 2 would be the quadratic. Use direct substitution, I get 5. If both of the one-sided limits are equal, what do you know about the limit as x approaches 2? Does it exist? Yes. And it is the same thing then as 2. Okay. So, or, yeah, as 5 there. Okay, so then the third criteria is we've got the function value, we've got the limit. Are those one and the same? And this is where we would definitely need to use this because, again, it may be obvious on the, on the um, Inspire, but it's, uh, you know, we don't have open holes that automatically get generated on the Inspire. So we look at those. The limit exists in Inspire, the output value exists in Inspire, and those are the same, so therefore, therefore, the function is continuous at 2 and at every place else, too, because of the nature of each of these. Okay. So now we come to my new problem here. <clears throat> Describe the intervals on which the given function is continuous. Explain why the function is continuous on the interval, and if the function has a discontinuity, identify the conditions of continuity that are not satisfied. That's, these are the three conditions we're talking about here. So I have that h of x is the composite function of f and g. I have f of x is 1 divided by the square root of x. I have g of x is x minus 1. Okay. <clears throat> if I am looking at h of x, and I know that it's f of g of x, what's another way I can write f of g of x? f of what? x minus 1. Why? <clears throat> because the output of this function is g of x, that's why we can write it in here, the output of one function is the input of the other. But we can also, because the equal sign tells us so, we can also then use x minus 1 as the, as the output of g of x, and that goes in here. So we have 1 divided by the square root of x minus 1. Now we have this uh, criteria over here that says x is greater than 1. Why would that be necessary? Again? Um, I don't get zero. Actually, I there. Yeah. So I don't. Well, okay. So I don't get zero. I don't want zero because it's undefined. But why is it greater than one? I could have simply said that x does not equal one, but this says. You know that would allow me to use other things like zero and negative one and so forth. <coughs> Yeah, I want real numbers only. If I have a, a one-half, if x is one-half, I'd have the square root of negative one-half. I want to stay with the real numbers, so I'm going to stay with positive radicands in there. Okay, now, describe the intervals in which the given function is continuous. So the given function now is h of x. f of x and g of x were important to us in order to build g of h of x, but uh, what? What would what interval would give us continuity on here? I'm going to erase that and start over again. That looks too sloppy to even put out there. Let's try it again. H of x is continuous. For what input values? We kind of said it, didn't we? Yeah. For the inputs greater than one. Other than that, we're going to have then some. Uh, unreal numbers, and we can't plot non-real numbers in on a 
coordinate plane of real numbers. So we don't have the ability to put those values in there, so we have to have that x is greater than 1. Okay. <clears throat> um, we could, if, it's, if it ha has a discontinuity, identify the conditions of the continuity that are not satisfied. Well, let's see. Um, is there... Um, you know, is there an h of 1? Does that exist? And that, that doesn't exist. So um, none exist. Okay. Uh, we can also say, well, what about the limit as x approaches 1? Again, we have to qualify this. Uh, we would have to qualify that we can only come to it from, great, from values greater than 1. And if we are coming to values greater than 1, what do you think is going to happen on this? If this is 1, and I approach this from values greater than 1. Pardon? I'm sorry, what was I doing? I'm sorry, I just didn't hear you. You didn't mean you were wrong. No, it's only one-sided. It's only one-sided, yes. Uh, I can identify a one-sided uh, limit here. And so you're right, the limit itself does not exist. What happens here? Does it just come up and stop? So we can say, well, what happens? Let's, uh, let's try this. What happens if, uh, suppose that x is equal to, um, oh, 1 and 1 tenth. What does, what would that equal? So what, one tenth, the square root of one tenth. Um, offhand, I don't know what the square root of one tenth is. We could get some estimates there. We're going to turn to the inspire in just a moment to see if we can help out. One point zero one. So that'd be one divided by the square root of uh, one point one and one hundredth minus one. That would be the same as one divided by the square root of one one hundredth. Now that we can do, can't we? The square root of 1 one hundredth. That multiplied to itself gives you 100. 10, okay. So this would be the same thing as 1 tenth. Well, what is 1 divided by 1 tenth? Multiply, invert multiply. 10. Well, let's see, what else do we know for sure? Um, what happens is, I, I don't know if anyone has this um, already imagined, I don't know if this is going to be a, a nice one to work on, but what is that? Uh, tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands? That should work. What's the square root of one one thousandth? Tens, hundred thousand, ten thousand, one ten thousandths. Or should it be hundred thousandths? Point zero one. Point zero one. In other words, one divided by one one hundredth. What's that? A hundred. What's going to happen if I choose another appropriate number that has a perfect square to it? I don't know what this number is, but let's suppose that's it. Is the, is the value going to be more or less than 100? So do you get the idea? What's going to happen to these output values? As we get closer and closer, what's going to happen? OK, yeah. So the limit from that one side doesn't even exist. So <clears throat> we want to know, is the composite function continuous? Well, is it continuous until we get to 1 would be a good question. Is there anything in our work that would indicate that as we take numbers farther and farther away from zero, that we would have anything that would be undefined? What if I put this to be 101? If x is 101, that would be 1 divided by the square root of 100. What's the square root of 100? So that would be 1 tenth. So if I'm out here at 101, my output is one tenth. If I had uh, x to be a hundred thousand, thank you very much. You have to kind of watch me every minute here, don't you? Okay. Um, definition of a con of continuity on a closed interval. 
Now this is kind of an interesting one because it's kind of like, well, yeah, it makes sense. But well, let's see what it says. If the function is defined on a closed interval. Now the function being defined on a closed interval, what does that closed interval tell us? Well, that symbol says that A is less than or equal to B, less than or, or excuse me, X, less than or equal to b. We include the endpoint. So it says the function is defined. Okay? Everywhere in there, there's an output, fun output value for a value that's in this interval. If the function is continuous on the open interval, how do you know that's an interval and not a pair of numbers? What's going to give it away? What is that? Oh, I heard it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell you again so I can... Who's speaking? Oh, the parentheses. Well, yeah, but if I have a pair of no, if I have a point, coordinates of a point, I use parentheses too. How do I know it's not a point? How do I know it's an interval? Pardon? Say it again. Nope. Because I could have, I could give you a point. Here's A. Here's B. And there's the point A B. Okay, so I, we could have it that way. What gives it away that it's an interval and not just a point? You're thinking much too hard. I'm trying to make it easy on you. How about the words interval? <laughs> Wouldn't that give it away? Yeah. Okay, so this is one of those things where you have to read it and you have to see what's there. Because we can, we can jump at this and say, it's a point. No, it's not a point because it says an open interval a b. That's one of those that we, we double use those uh, parentheses in many ways and this is one that can trip you up so don't don't let it do that to you. Okay so the function is defined, the function is continuous on the open interval. So given a um, an interval let's call this a and let's call this b and if it's an open interval we have those open ends there. And we know it's continuous here. We know it's defined here. So everything looks very nice in here. But how do we know that it is <coughs> continuous on the closed interval? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, well, here's what we're going to do. The, <coughs> we're going to look at, remember the, the definition or the condition says the limit as x approaches. Well, if you can't approach this from the other direction, then you can't really talk about the limit as x approaches a. It has to be both directions. I can't do it because there's nothing over here. So this is why on, in this one we say the limit as x approaches a from the greater than a, if as you approach a from the greater than a values, your output, your limit is your output value. So that means I could go in and fill that in. And if I approach b from the less than b, so I can't do it from the greater than, it just doesn't exist. If that limit has the same value as the output at that point, now, now I've got a closed interval. Okay, now I can talk about the closed interval. The, the uh, non-example, the um, opposite of this would be this. What if I have everything we had before? We've got this nice function. It looks just like that. Is it defined? Yes. Is it uh, continuous on the interval? Yes. But at A, f of A is up here. And if at B, f of B is down here, would that be a, a continuous function on the closed interval? No. So that's what it's saying. It's saying don't be misled. It, you could have this situation happen. We don't want it to happen. We know you know that limits come from both directions. You can't do it on this one. So we'll just we'll let you know that if you come from this direction on this interval, end of the interval, and come from this direction on this end of the interval, and those all match up, you got it. You're okay there. That's basically all it's saying. Why is this important? Well, <clears throat> to be real honest, in the life of your in your life of business calculus, probably not as much as it would be for someone studying mathematics. And to go on into more calculus for more business uh, majors, some of them do go on to more calculus. That's their, that statement's important because we can use it now to do proofs for other functions, other theorems rather, other statements. And that's why it's important. But it's also nice just to see the, 
the uh, situations that can come up. Okay, five more minutes, and then we're going to have to <clears throat> break this and go to um, our quiz. Discuss the continuity of the function f of x on the closed interval 0, 4, and then talk about any discontinuities that may come up. Okay, <clears throat> first of all, is this function defined everywhere in the interval? So that's the first thing we have to consider. Is f of x defined everywhere in the interval 0 to 4? How will you determine that? Well, how do you determine if it's defined there? Pardon? How would we test it? Okay, we could put some points in. You know, put one in, two in, three in, so on. Sometimes they're sneaky, though. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that would be the other thing we could do. Let's consider what would make our denominator zero. Isn't that the place where this function would be undefined? Is it where the denominator is zero? Yeah. So, <clears throat> consider where x squared minus 4x plus 3 would equal 0. Now, this has given us the idea that we could factor. I don't know if we can or not. Okay, but is it possible to factor that trinomial? Again, we spent a lot of time in Algebra 1 doing all this factoring. You've got an Inspire, right? That could do the factoring for you if you get lazy, because this is not how to factor a trinomial class. But let's just give it a go. x here, x here. What is it? x minus 3, x plus 1. Has to be a minus there, too, okay, in order to come up with the positive 3, okay? If that denominator factors, do you think it is? I'm taking your word for it. Okay? If that's true, then what do you know about x minus 3 and what do you know about x minus 1? Well, they're defined. They're defined. Two, two numbers go walking together. When they meet, I guess they're walking together, they have met, but when they meet, they dissolve into nothingness, zero. Uh, I can't do that. That's not. That's a silly story. I was going to try to make up something, but it doesn't work here. Okay. Anyway. If we have if we have two numbers that multiply together that give us a zero, what do you know for sure, without a doubt, about one of those numbers? One of them has to be zero. Do you know which one? No, I don't either. Don't know which one. One of them has to be zero. What if it's this one? If that's the case, what is the value of x? Three. What if it's this one? So the, po the places where this fraction could, have, could be undefined would be at x equals 3 and x equals 1. Is there, are there any discontinuities in this function? Do 3 and 1 reside in the closed interval from 0 to 4? Yes. Yes. Any possibilities that those might be where this might be zero or undefined? Yeah. So, do we have any discontinuities? Yeah. So, therefore. Wait, I have a question. Yes. So, how did you figure that out? Did you just plug those points Well, no. What I did, I took your suggestion. Yeah, you factored it. <laughs> I factored it. And if by chance this is my zero factor, that means that x is 3. If this is my zero factor, that means this is 1, or x is 1. 1 and 3 reside in the interval from 0 to 4. So if I use the value 3, am I going to have something undefined here? Let's try it out. f of 3. What is f of 3? You're working too hard if you push buttons on this one. 
You will get an undefined value, won't you? Yeah, you will get an undefined value. And what happens if you use f of 1? If you, if you use 1 in there? Same thing, yeah. Uh, we'll get 1 divided by 0. It's undefined. So is this function undefined in the interval? Yeah, it's not defined everywhere. So is, is it discontinuous in that interval? Yeah. So we say it is discontinuous at x equaling 3 and x equaling 1. Wow. Did we do that or what? Look at that. New piece of technology, so this hopefully will work just fine. It seems to be working fine. Okay. Um, we are discussing in this section, let's just kind of go back a little bit and, and see what we're doing here. Uh, we're talking about continuity. And um, to get into our work, let's just do a little review. <coughs> uh, a big piece of what we are doing in calculus is having to deal with continuous functions. And if we don't know if we have a continuous function or not, it can play havoc with what uh, we know uh, to do. So let's just do a little review. A review of continuity. Now, try not to look back in the notes. You know, let's see how much you can remember of this uh, from our discussion before. Um, there are three conditions for continuity. Let me just put an example up here. Would you say that function is continuous? Okay. Um, it, you say it then it's discontinuous everywhere? At a point. Okay, at a point. Why do you say it's discontinuous there? And what does that open circle tell you? It's undefined. Okay, so the first criteria or condition of this is that f of c is defined. Okay, so we know that that function, as it's drawn now, is undefined, or is, is not continuous at C, because the function is not defined at C. Well, what if I put a dot right there? Now is the function defined at C? Yeah, it happens to be defined down here. We'll call this A, okay? So we could say that, um, yes, it is defined, and F of C has a value of A. That's a C there, okay? Second criteria, because if all I have is this, is this part of my definition, my criteria, is the function defined at C? Yes. Well, then the function must be continuous, but we know it's not. Why not? Well, but the open circle is filled in down here. Okay, so... Okay, you, <laughs> you can't clap. Tell me what that, what that concept now is. We say we can't clap when we're looking at what kind of a mathematical problem? Because you're absolutely right. We said we can't clap, we couldn't clap when we were looking at what type of problem? I'll give you a hint. It's the name of the section. 1.5. What do we study about in 1.5? Yeah, it's a major idea. Actually, it's the, it's the first new information for most of you that we've had this semester. Go back and look. What's section 1.5? Limits. Limits. Limits, yes. Okay, so when we, when we said, when we were looking at limits, there was a condition of having, you know, a function has a limit if you can clap, okay, meaning what? So the limit as x what? Approaches what? Now when I say the limit as x approaches c, inherent in that statement are two actions. Approaching c from both sides, yeah. From the less than C side, 
okay, from the less than C site and from the greater than C site. So if the limit exists of this function, then we say it has met that condition for continuity. So we've got that it's defined, check. Is there a limit as x approaches c? Well, now see, I need to know your name. I'm going to get to know them as I pass papers out. But Angie said we could clap. Oh, you don't think we can clap? As I approach, as I approach c from the less than c side, where are my output values going? Right to here. And if I approach C from the greater than C side, where are my output values going? Right to here. Let's call that B, output value B. Is there a limit to the output values? And if so, what is it? To be or not to be, right? To be. It is B. Okay, there you go. It is. There is a limit. Check. Done. It's met two conditions for continuity. But would you say this function is continuous at C? No. So there's a third condition that is the most important condition of all. So now the question is, what is that third and most important condition? Yeah, uh, Alyssa, uh, Alyssa, sorry. Yeah. Okay, you're, you're on the right, you're on the right track. I know the fact that we have a limit it goes to here. Okay, but the fact that the output value is really down here. So what is that third and final one? Alyssa's got us going on this. She's got the idea. Yeah. The limit of f of x. What now? Oop, you're missing something. I can't, I can't go on until you finish it. As x approaches c, okay, equals what? Uh, f of c. Okay, the fact that we have an output value, good, we need it, isn't enough. Sufficient, necessary, but not sufficient. The fact that we have a limit, necessary, but not sufficient, what is sufficient is that those have one and the same values there. Okay, so that's a review of continuity. We know that this function is not continuous. Therefore, f of x is not continuous. Now, can I just say that it's not continuous? I have to add on something, which is what? Yeah. Yeah, because the function is continuous every place else, isn't it? Yeah, every place else, is it's just at one point. Okay. Um, let's now continue with the work that we had here. And uh, let's see. Make sure that we don't skip a problem here. Okay. It says, sketch the graph of the function and describe the interval or intervals on which the function is continuous. Is continuous. Now, again, sometimes the best way to answer that question is to ask, answer the other question, and that is, where is it not continuous? If I know where it's not continuous, then I know I can determine where it is, because it's going to be every place except at that point. Looking at this function, I'll bet every one of you can tell me one input value that could cause real problems to us. Someone said it. Zero. Why? Yeah, it's undefined. We cannot divide by zero. So we know that at this point, we cannot use zero. Now, let's see, though, if we can. And, and the, the, the phrase is, 
you know, are there any removable discontinuities? Well, we really don't remove the discontinuity. We just rewrite the function so that it looks like it's gone. But we always have to go back to the original. And in the original, we can't use zero. I don't care what we see otherwise. We can't use zero in any of this because the original said we couldn't. But we can look at a function that's equivalent to this that will help us out. So if I look at this, I think I can factor out an x, and I think you could agree with me, from the numerator. Once I factor out that, that numerator, we know what we can do with that. There they go. Factors are gone. The factor of x, that is. Okay. And I'm left with x squared plus 1. Now, again, I always have to, will have to check with this class um, what information we have compared to what we have in my other classes. Because in there, I know we had a um, theorem. And here we just call them um, definitions or whatever. So let me go back a ways and uh, see if we can pick this one up here. There's something back here that's going to help us. Whoops, there it was. You see it? Very top? Yeah. A polynomial function is continuous everywhere. Now, we don't know what a polynomial is, of course. But if we know that a polynomial function is continuous everywhere, how can that help us in our problem? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is a polynomial. Polynomial functions are continuous everywhere. Since f of x is equivalent to this rational function, this fraction, and this fraction is equivalent to this polynomial, then we can say, therefore, f of x is continuous everywhere. But can we stop there? Remember, we have to go back to the original problem. And in the original problem, we said you can't use zero. So we have to say continuous everywhere, x not equal to zero. What do you think would happen on the inspires if we put this function in the inspires and try to place a point at zero? It would have that message that says, you know, it's undefined, it, you know, that you can't use that input and so forth. Why? Because it is undefined at that value. Okay. What is this function, what does this function look like on the Inspire? Good. Pick them up. Let's see what we've got here. Be sure to put in the original. Don't put in anything but the original. If you, if you make a mistake on, on your, al your uh, algebra, your calculations, you'll never know it if you, unless you put in the original. Did everyone start with a fresh document? You know, go home, new document, just say no, that type of thing. Okay. So um, if we go in here, let's see, we need to have a fraction. And that was, I believe, x cubed. Be sure you bring down that cursor so you have it where you want it. x cubed plus x. Is anyone watching the time for me? I think I know that we're, getting, you know, we're close. So you know, I'm trying not to go over four, uh, 15. OK, so if I, if I graph this, there's that parabola. Raise one unit up on horizontal uh, translation. We go in here, we put a point on. We know how to do that. We're really good at that now. So we put a point on. We change the value of that. Uh, go into menu. Go down to that, uh, was it number seven? 
And because we're so close, oh, she's working on that on our How do we put that coordinate to zero? We go over, we, we uh, hover on the input, we tap enter twice, open up a text box. How do you read them by like something? Uh, press escape. Mm -hmm. Make sure it's a point on, yes, that's a good, a good thing. Now, it's not that this class is about Inspire, that you have to know how to use it, but it can sure help us because when I ask you on a quiz or a test, to show me graphical proof that you understand this, you know, except the problem, whatever, you often want to put a point on and change the coordinates. Yes? Um, hit escape. OK, now try it. Just hover and then hit enter twice. OK? And when you press 0 there, we do get that message. Invalid input, can't do it, OK? So how do, we, um, how do we fool the calculator into thinking that it's really, that it's there when it's not? Don't, yeah, don't, you could drag it, but that's not going to help as much. I, I, I suppose it is. I suppose you could, Daniel. You could drag it. Um, I, I, the reason I hesitate to have you do that any and all times is because sometimes it can really mess with our head. Because we think we're there when we're really not. This is the better way. OK, so how close do I need to get? Yeah, just get you know, kind of close, as close as you want. And then it will look like it's there. Now let me, let's go through this, because this is something else. I have 1e e to the negative h. I don't want that. OK, I want it to say 0. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to hover, just get it to hover, and then press the plus, minus, you know, so do a plus, 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 and see what happens. Do a minus, minus, a subtraction key. Because if you do that, what happens is it will change the number of digits displayed in that. In that. So if I now do a plus, I'm going to get a bunch of zeros there. If I do a subtraction, I'm going to get... So it, I'm going to fool it into thinking that it's there. We know it's really not. You're looking... Pardon? You have to hover. Don't do anything but hover. Don't, don't hit enter. Don't do anything. Just get it to hover. OK? Just hover over it. OK, now, if you leave it like this, is it correct? What's wrong with it? Yeah. On your paper, you can draw an open circle. If you do want to do this, uh, you can go to um, Menu. Actions, and there's this thing called attributes. There's other ways of getting there, but this is one sure way everyone can follow. Menu, action, and then attributes. If we press enter, go to the point. And you get this other icon, and it says point on. Now, yeah, that's what I want, so I'm going to press enter. And I have then this menu that's going to pull down. And now if I use a right or left, I can change the way that point looks on there. I can change the attributes of that point. Menu, actions, attributes. Okay, and then point to what you want to have. I could change the, the way that the parabola is drawn. It could be dotted, it could be bold, it could, you know, I can do a lot of things. But this is one thing, and now we have an open circle there. Now you, now you have exactly the graph you need. You know it's an open circle. It's at 0, 1 is where the open circle is. And this, would, this should match your analytical work. So I will be looking for the next quiz. Not everyone's going to want to do this. I understand. And that's OK. But on your paper, you need to draw it also. And you need to have then an open circle also. So your drawing looks the same. It's just that some, some of us enjoy using the technology better than others. And that's OK if you don't. OK. OK, there we go. That's that problem. Uh, let's, did we answer the question? It's continuous everywhere except x at 0. And we know that because we can resolve that function down to a polynomial. Polynomial functions are continuous everywhere. But the original problem, you cannot use 0. <coughs> that type of work comes up a lot in our, um, in our 
assignments and our homework. So um, let's consider, can I, can I rewrite this function to be something that looks simpler? OK, speaking of something that looks simpler, here's an interesting problem. Find the constant a. a is not a very, or it's not an article of speech. It is a variable we have here. Find uh, it's a constant, but it's a letter representing a constant. And the constant, and the constants a and b. So we actually have a and b here. I, I have to go back and see if I mistyped that. But anyways, find a and b such that the function is continuous on the entire real line. How would you describe the function? The format of this, it is a piecewise. It's a function defined in pieces. That's why we call it a piecewise defined function. OK. Um, I am going to sketch out as much as I can of this, of this problem. So um, let's see. Um, I have something called a 1, and I uh, 2, 3. I need a 3 there. I need a negative 1. Um, so I have a negative 1, I have a 1, and, I, and then I go up to 3. OK. OK, so that's my, uh, those are the important input values we have to think about. Now, it doesn't say that those are the only input values, negative 1 and 3, but those are the ones we have to keep our eye on. The first piece. We can sketch that. Let's look at this. The first piece. When we see this number 2 here, are we looking at a um, input or output? Are we looking at an input or output? The 2 in the first piece. And let's look at this. Is this representing an input or an output? OK, so this is representing an output. OK, so that's representing an output. And it says the output has the, you know, equals is one of those symbols that we use so much we don't know what it means at times. When you see this symbol, equals, and it is sitting between something like this, what does that symbol represent? So simple, yet so hard sometimes. <coughs> what means that those two are equal? Well, what do you mean those two are equal? The value of the expression on the left side, how does it relate to the value of the expression on the right side? It is the same, yes. Well, if I come up here and I have f of x as the output, here's that equal sign. It says f of x output value equals, is 2 an input or an output? If you're saying the output equals, you better have an output equals an output. Otherwise, you don't have an equality. Correct? Output equals output? OK. So what does the 2 represent? In unison, the class whole all says output. OK. What does negative 2 stand for? Output again. Yeah. Output has the same value as output. What does AX plus B stand for? Output, output again. Yeah. This is why I go over input and output so much. This is why you had those two or three questions on the quiz. We don't know what we're really talking about unless we can translate it into terms we understand better than some symbols. So we have the output has the same value as an output. So it, it, when you look at it now, it's kind of obvious, isn't it? These are outputs. Someone suggested I need a negative 2 here. Do you still think I need a negative 2? No, <laughs> because this is an output. OK, so let's see. The output is equal to 2. What kind of a graph is that? Well, I'll give me more. 
kinds of straight lines I can horizontal thank you that's that's a good straight line I have I know the direction of it as well horizontal it's horizontal from what to what infinity all the way across here right So if I know that this is 2 right here, then I know, it, do I have an open circle or a closed circle? Closed because it's or equal to, okay. So for all the inputs less than or equal to negative 1, I'm going to have this, let's see if I can draw this horizontal line here. There we go. That's the first piece. That's the piece right there. That's all I know from the first piece. What about the third piece? What kind of a graph? For what? For values three. So, so I'm going to have to be down here, negative two, closed circle, open circle, close. What direction? In the right direction, <laughs> or the correct one? Okay. So there we go. Now, that piece, the third piece right there. What kind of a graph do you expect to see on this middle piece? Pardon? Are you asking or telling me? <laughs> I like to have statements, not questions back, okay? So tell me with conviction. It's a linear function. Yes, it is a linear function. And if it's linear, do we know if it goes downhill or uphill? Let's Let's consider the problem. It says, find the constants a and b such that the function is continuous. I've got the first piece and the last piece. If this function is continuous, how, that middle piece had better go which way? Uphill or downhill? downhill? It better go downhill. It better go from here down to here, right? Otherwise, am I going to have a continuous function? No. Now, have we used anything except Algebra 1 stuff so far? You know, this whole class, I keep saying, telling everyone, uh, Math 50 as well, I really do not teach you any new mathematics. All we do is repackage what you already know, throw in some terms you haven't heard before, maybe some notation, but everything we do is based in math you've already had, Algebra 1, Algebra 2, okay? So, so far... We really have it. It's the whole way this thing's packaged. We have to unwrap it to make sure that we understand each piece. So we understand these pieces. We know what continuity is. We know then that if we're going to have a continuous function, this thing had better go downhill. So A had better be negative. Better be. Okay. Now, <clears throat> here's the other thing. If we're going to connect these two pieces together, <clears throat> right up here, what value is this going to have to have at this endpoint? AX plus B is going to have to have what value? Now, AX plus B is an output, right? Okay. What's the output value here? How much? Two. Two. Okay. So AX plus B has to have what value at this point? Two. Two. Now, can I use negative one in here? No. Why? It doesn't say I'm allowed to. But I do know, let's get rid of this, I do know that at x equaling negative 1, ax plus b has the same value as, as what? is negative 1, this is going to be negative A plus B equals how much? And you said it, 2. Okay? So I'm going to replace the, uh, the X with negative 1. At that point, now remember, I can't use it, but many times in math we say, well, just suppose I could. Okay? Just suppose I could. If I could, what would its value be? Well, if I could, its value would be the opposite of A plus B, and the output would be 2. Okay, over here, <clears throat> at x equaling 3, I can't use 3, can I? But suppose I could. What's 
what's the value of this? Yes. Oh, thank you. What is this? What is AX plus B if we could use 3 for X? Well, X is 3, right? 3A plus B. And what's the output value? Negative 2. Okay. Now, look at this. I've got 3A plus B is negative 2. I've got A, opposite of A plus B is 2. I've got to find the values of A and B. Boy, I sure wish I knew some mathematics that would help me solve for two unknowns in two equations. Any suggestions? What is it? <laughs> suggestions? Known as solving a what? Ever hear? A system of equations. We're going to solve a system of equations. Your question? Well, if I'm going to put 3 into, if, I, if I'm over here, this, at this point, that line I'm, I'm going to draw to connect the pieces, that, the output value has got to be the same as that. Okay? So we're going to solve a system. Did you ever solve a system before? Absolutely. I know you have. Negative A plus B equals 2. And 3a plus b equals negative 2. You had a couple ways you can solve the system. One was the graphical way. See if the two lines meet, find the point of intersection. We did that back in Algebra 1. Another way is called the substitution method. Solve one of these variables, like b equals something in a. We place that into the b down here. And then we have everything in a. We have one equation, one variable. Remember that substitution method? third way is called the linear combination method. We multiply one of the equations on both sides. As long as we do it to both sides, we haven't changed the value with a common, with, with a, a factor. And then we see that we have opposite that quantities when we add these equations together. And we have then one equation, and we can solve for that. Which one you want to opt for? Substitution? OK. Now, this would be great if I had negative 3a up here. Then I can have negative 3a plus 3a, and they would cancel out. It would also be great if this were an opposite of b instead of a b, and then I could cross out the b's. I don't really care which one we do. Who has a preference? Good. Let's go with that. I'm assuming someone said. Let's, let's multiply the first equation through by a negative. That gives me a minus b equals negative 2. I have then my 3a plus b equals negative 2. And I end up with 4a equals negative 4. Can I solve this for a? a is negative 1. What did we say about the line connecting those two pieces? It had to go what direction? And if it goes downhill, what's the slope? And what's the, what's the place of A in this equation? Oh, we're on to something, OK? We're on to something, because now at least we have the line going downhill. So I have that the slope is A. A is negative 1. I'm in the right direction. If I know that A is negative 1, can I find B? Yes. Yes, OK? I have uh, the opposite of A plus B equals 2. So the opposite of A plus, whoops, let's go back and make this correct. I have the opposite of negative 1 plus B equals 2. B has a value of? The opposite of negative 1 is positive 1. Subtract 1 from both sides. We have that B is equal to 1 also. So I have now found that a is negative 1 and b is 1. So what? <laughs> Don't you ever feel like that sometimes? So what? Who cares? I got answers. What does it mean to the problem? Well, let's go back. If I substitute now this piece, we'll put it over here. If I say a is negative 1, that's negative x. If I say b is 1, that's negative x plus 1. Would that be sufficient to make those connect? Raise a hand. How many think it will? Ooh, not too much confidence in this. Well, let's give it a try. 
Take your inspires. Uh, let's add another graphing page. If you're like me, you've got F2 of X. I need to find a template for a piecewise defined function. Where do I find the templates? It depends on which one you're on, okay? So if you're on the black key, you have your own, your very own key. If you're on the gray one, it's control. Did someone say control X? Who said that? <laughs> okay, multiplication. Don't, if you say control X, I'm going to look for the, uh, the letter X, okay? <laughs> so, yeah, she was trying to lead us astray back there. Okay, multiplication. Remember, we don't use X for multiplication in this class. Okay, now, we have two possibilities. We've got this icon here, this template here, that is only good if we have two pieces. How many pieces do we have? Three. We need to go to the one next door, okay? Go over to the one next door. Make sure you have the one that has the commas in it. Press Enter. And it's going to say, okay, how many pieces? Three. So we can just press Enter for OK. I don't know, how, how many do you think you could have on here? Oh, my goodness. Can you imagine? I got 20. I got 30. Oh, my goodness. I really don't know how many. I, just for kicks. 50? Wow, look at that. That looks pretty interesting. I don't want to do that problem, though. OK. What am I going to do that one? Let's see. I probably lost everything, though. There we go. We'll get back to, I'll get back on task here. Anyway, we just want to have three of these. Okay, so we're going to have three. Now, what's the first piece? Two. Tab. We use that output for what part of our domain? X less than or equal to. On the gray one, how do you get a less than or equal to? Because you got a less than key. Control. If you're on the black one, you got your very own little template for those inequalities. Did you find it? Okay. Uh, less than or equal to negative 1. Tab. Now, are you going to put an AX plus B? No. You know, I just thought of a really neat thing I could have showed you. I could put in what they call a slider, and we could change it and see what happens when I change A and B, but I'm not going to do that because we know it. We know it to be negative X plus 1 tab. It's good for what? Negative 1 less than X less than 3 tab. And we've got negative 2 tab. And this is good for X what? Greater than or equal to 3. Okay. If this is correct, we should see a, what looks like a continuous function. Zach, did it work? But how can we be sure? You could do what's called trace. I don't use trace as much, but some of you might like it. We go to trace, go to graph trace. And I, we can use the uh, left and right arrow keys. I will tell you, if you do, you know, I'm pressing this like crazy. And then I let go. Oops, it didn't do it. But on the handheld, it keeps going. Okay? So um, I don't like that as well. I'm looking down here at uh, negative 1. Whoops, I kind of skipped it because it, it's going on pixels. So that's not my favorite way to do this. Yes? Uh, I plugged it in wrong. Okay. I would uh, press tab, and then you should be able to uh, go back in and make some changes. Yeah, go back and just press tab, and then you should get the entry line back. Let's do a point on. We'll do a point on. Let's do two points on. I'm going to move this text up here so we can see it. There we go. I'm going to move this text down here so I can really see it. I'm not sure. Where did that come from? Hmm. 
what did I do? Okay, we'll go back and fix it for you later, if you're okay with that. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what that's doing down there. Um, Well, whatever. Okay, if I come over here, I'm going to change this to um, negative 1. If it works, it should just immediately go to that point. If it doesn't, we're going to get that error message. Well, it went to that. Down here, I'm going to change this. Move this to 3. Whoops, I'll try it again. Move this to 3, and there it is. Again, I don't know what this is doing down here. We'll just hide it. Okay. It works. It's there. We connected the pieces nicely. And so we can go in here and connect those pieces. Because this is the graph of that. Right there. Okay. This is one of the problems that it takes a little more time to do. It's not, you know, piece by piece it's not hard. But it's when you put it all together. That's what math is all about. Taking the pieces we know and putting it together in maybe different ways that we never thought about before. Okay. Um, let's look at this next problem. The greatest integer problem. Uh, the greatest integer Function. There's a function we actually can talk about. Uh, it's talking about the, as it says, the greatest integer that does not exceed. The one you have to be careful about is the, are the negatives. Remember, negative 3 is less than negative 2. And so negative 3 is, is the greatest integer less than negative 2.89. Okay, it has a symbol like that. To be honest, we don't talk about this function. I don't think I, I, I can't think of very many problems that even come up in our homework uh, exercises in the book, and I don't think I've ever chosen any for the online homework stuff. Um, but just in case you're interested, we can talk about it as a function. And when we, we graph the function, let's say we, we graph. Um, I'm not sure what number you're at, so I'm just going to make it f of x. You can choose whatever number you want. But uh, if you have f4 of x and put in f4 of x, there is a command. Thank you. There is a, um, a command that, uh, whoops, let me get out of that, that we can use. I'm on f3 of x. It's not, well, it really is someplace, but it's on the calculation page. So the best way to tell you to find it, besides typing it in, is to go to catalog. And if you're not on the first menu item, the catalog is right there on the gray one. If it's not on the, on the first menu item, just press numeral 1. It's the only way to get to that. You can't tab or anything. And then type in the word, the letter F, and you get down to the, uh, to the Fs of that listing. And just keep going down, 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 until you get to the word floor. Okay? The Inspire uses something called floor or ceiling for these functions. So I'll, let's come back to think about it. This function is saying... There we go. This function is saying, what is the greatest integer that does not exceed 2x minus 1? Well, if you think about these values, if you think about a floor and a ceiling, the, gr the least integer that you can find is going to be down here. Your number is going to be above it, greater than it. This is a vertical number line, for instance. And so we, we talk about it as the floor. So the command is floor. So here you'd have floor comma 2x minus 1. 
And when you look at that graph, so let me just type it in here, 2x minus 1, and when we type it in, we get, you often find these called step functions, because they look like steps going up. Now, the only thing that's missing here is which one has the open circle and which one has the closed circle on each one of these. Because if we're looking at the 4, we want the greatest integer that does not exceed this. So we're looking at a step that's going to be in a closed circle on that end and an open circle on that end. So each of your steps would have a closed circle here and an open circle on that. Again, we don't really talk a lot about this, uh, the greatest integer function, but it, it's one of those that I know you've seen in other, other classes, but you probably called it a step function instead. Okay, again, I don't know that you have any in your homework, but it is a part of the text, and I just thought you might enjoy looking at it and seeing what it is. A common example of the step function, you park in a parking lot, and they say that you know, if you're there up to um, three minutes or whatever, you have one price and then you jump to the next. Okay, that would be another type of function. That would be called the ceiling one because if you've ever had the experience, you're here from you know, time from A to B, the minute you get one second over that time, it's, well, <laughs> the time around here is the same way. The minute you get one second over it, it boosts you up to the next level. And the minute you get here in one second over, it jumps you to the next level. So that would be called the ceiling. The ceiling would be the, the term we'd use on those. But a lot of things in life uses the step function. And so it's either do we go to the least one or to the greatest number. Okay. Um, I really want to spend some time with you on the quiz. And um, I think we'll, we'll call this a wrap on this one.